be a rapidly vanishing summer. I was talking to some junior league colleagues this morning, and we were all bemoaning the fact that even though it's not quite the middle of August, we have school buses pulling up and children getting on and fall clothing, you know, being displayed all over the place. And somebody said they swear that they saw some holiday decorations in a store. Um, so here we are at the tail end of a beautiful summer, and we're going to spend the next hour focusing on nominating. And we are looking at nominating at this point in the rollout because, as you will hear over the next hour, we are proposing that leagues really seriously uh, reframe and reimagine the role that nominating plays. And, and frankly, this is a nominating paradigm, for, for lack of a better word, that we've actually been um, presenting, training to, consulting to for many years more than we have been focusing on the new governance structure. In fact, I started um, this presenting this new nominating paradigm probably, gosh, a little more than 10 years ago. It used to be a track at ODI. It is now incorporated into the governance track at ODI. So in a sense, this nominating paradigm actually um, anticipated the governance restructure and predates it significantly. Nevertheless, it is one that is going to, um, I believe, make it um, significantly better, stronger, all those good words. However, um, nominating is its own interesting entity, so um, here we go. We're going to spend some time looking at it today, but we're looking at it in a very different way. But before we do that, um, we are delighted. Uh, we've been talking about the full team. We have been anticipating the latest arrival to the transformation rollout team. Um, I think we even told you what her name was the last time, but this time we can actually show you her picture. So here, here we all are, all six of us, Amber Levy being the new director of membership um, who joined the AJLI staff in late July and is already up to her elbows in um, both things junior league, things membership, and um, increasingly incorporating an understanding of the transformation rollout and how all of that plays out. So we're, we're thrilled that we have everybody on the team now, all of us working together. And um, before we get started, as we always do, here are some reminders of upcoming events. The roundtable that will be the more informal discussion for this rollout webinar on nominating will be on Tuesday, August the 30th. Um, we will focus on um, competencies and job descriptions, but I'm always open to using those roundtables to identify any issues that you all are wanting to talk about, any challenges that you're experiencing, any ideas that you have related to the topic of the month. But we, we will probably try to spend a little bit of, in, of focus time on competencies and job descriptions. Then, very quickly, if this nominating isn't enough for you, we're going to immediately then, following the nominating month being August, in September, we're going to focus on bylaws. Um, and again, there is a scheduling logic to this, particularly for those of you that are anticipating implementing the new structure this year. Um, it will involve some bylaw changes and those will require a vote of your membership. And so it was important that we get the bylaw information to you in September so that you could, in fact, anticipate. And I know that when we looked at some of your timelines last month, some of you are planning on um, operationalizing this year. And so the, the, the bylaw focus for the month of September will significantly facilitate that. And obviously the roundtable to support that uh, we'll look at how you draft the language that is necessary to introduce the new structure. But these are, these are some important upcoming dates that we want you to make sure that you put into your calendar. And then, here we go. Before we get started, um, I want you to pop into the chat box. And I would like you to think of one word that you believe currently describes the state of nominating in your junior league. One word, the current state of nominating in your junior league. So into the chat box you go.
confidential. Yep. Organized. Great. Lynn, excellent. Glad to hear that. You will be able to share some of your organizing tips with us. One word, don't overthink it. Confidential again, yes. Painstaking. Thank you, Tori. <laughs> I knew we had to get I knew we had to get onto the other side of the ledger. Struggle. Yes, Wendy. It is indeed a struggle for many leagues. Disconnected. Aha. That's that's an important topic that we're going to talk about today. Structured. Aha. Uh-huh. Yep, challenged. Okay, those are um those are great words and they actually together I think probably quite accurately um define the state of nominating in the junior league today and very much are um descriptive if you will of some of the issues that we have been working on as we designed the new nominating framework. So, our work for today will focus on understanding a new nominating paradigm and learning about the tools that support that paradigm, and then beginning to outline a plan to move you down the path to a, to a new nominating system. So, at its essence, the job of nominating in the junior league is to collaborate with the board to ensure that you have a sustainable, qualified leadership pool or leadership pipeline. It is to ensure that the elected leaders of the league, and I will include in that the management team, which um, may or may not be formally elected. There, as, as you've heard me comment, there are a couple of ways that the management team can, in fact, um, be chosen, although I, I would say that most leagues are also having them elected. Um, so when we talk about elected leaders of a junior league, today we are talking about the governing board, we are talking about the management team, and we are talking about the nominating committee itself. Um, and the goal is to ensure that those leaders have the desired skills and competencies to fulfill their responsibilities, obviously based on who's available in the candidate pool. And then the third responsibility of nominating is to ensure a process that is accessible to all who are eligible and qualified. And you're going to hear me use the words eligible and qualified quite a bit today because one of the contextual shifts, if you will, for the nominating paradigm is that while we want a system that is transparent and accessible, we are focusing on a system that will be designed to identify the most qualified individuals available who are eligible to be considered. So um, in some senses what we are suggesting is that there is an intentional selectivity to the nominating process that does differ it from many other opportunities in the junior league where there tends to be a sense that you know, we want everybody to be interested, we want everybody to be involved, we want everybody to have a turn. Quite frankly, when you start to talk about the nominating function and the elected leadership of an organization, well, you don't want to turn interested people away. You are actually needing to apply a more strategic lens. And so you're going to hear me talk a lot about the ideas of the concepts of eligibility and qualification because we really do need to become much more strategic and much more organizationally focused when we think about the nominating systems that a junior league has. You will also notice that I have used only the word nominating. And so here's the first big shift for those of you that are not in this spot and get ready with your chat box fingers because I'm going to ask you in a minute to tell me. But we are talking in this webinar exclusively about the nominating function 
which is very different from the placement function. And that is why the association is urging leagues to separate the two if, in fact, they presently are combined into a single nominating placement committee. So let me pause for just a minute, ask you to go into the chat box, and tell me, um, is, do you currently have a joint nominating placement committee, or do you have a separate nominating committee? regardless of how you handle placement. So we've got a lot of joints. Great, okay. Interesting blend, okie doke. So, um, when I introduced the concept that they need to be separated, and they, they actually were way back in the day, they used to always be separated, then they got blended together in some leagues, primarily I think to accommodate to um, membership declines and um, the idea that they were sort of related and so you might as well put them together. Um, one of the things that for those of you that have indicated that you are joint, I don't want you to be anxious um, and really imagine that what I'm going to ask you to do in separating them is to, let's say for the sake of argument, you have a nine-member nominating placement committee. The goal in separating them is not to also then create a nine-member nominating committee. So we're not talking about needing to double the number of people that are dedicated to those two functions, but we are talking about separating the functions. And the reason for that is what I talk about here. The nominating function is a governance function, and it is focused on what the league needs in its leadership in order to be effective. The placement function is focused on the member and what opportunities need to be available to her for her development as a civic leader. They are very closely related. I absolutely always talk about them as being first cousins, but they have different orientations. Um, and that results in two things that I think really under, um, undercut or underscore, rather, why we argue that they should be separated. The first being that both are significant full-time responsibilities. I know we tend to think of nominating as really not being a full job because, after all, the slate is out in December and what else do they have to do? Well, actually, a healthy nominating system is one that operates full year, full round, because you're always in the leadership cultivation business as well as that very targeted period when the nominating committee is doing candidate reviews, doing candidate analysis, and doing the slating. So it's a it's a it's a problem to ask a group to take to take on both of these functions, which really are significant in terms of their time commitment. But I think the more significant reason that we argue for their separation is the fact that they really do have different orientations. A nominating committee is trying to put together a team to lead the league. A placement process is trying to create maximal choice and opportunity for members to develop their leadership opportunities. So it's a different focus. The, um, if you will, on the placement side, you will always try to tilt to what the individual would like to be experiencing. On the nominating side, you actually shouldn't do that. You should actually tilt to what the league will be best served by in terms of the team of leaders that are available to it. So they have very different areas of focus. Um, and it's important that we really um, that we really understand that. I think I will plant another idea with you, or I'll plant another um, revolutionary concept with you, is that I think another reason that they have been put together is that the assumption was that it is through placement that nominating would get the information that they needed about whether or not anybody was likely to be good at a particular job. And that is a connection, that is a source of information that we propose actually be broken because it actually isn't particularly valid and I will I will get into that in a little while. But the idea being that the placement advisor was either asked to come in and present all of those for whom she was an advisor and kind of assess them in terms of she'd be good as a chair, she should be considered for the board. Or alternatively, those placement advisors were also making the nominating decisions 
and that is a connection that, that we propose be broken um, because we think it actually doesn't serve the league well um, and doesn't actually get you to the best place in terms of the most qualified candidate. So the areas of focus are different. They are related, but they are very different. And so we argue that they should, in fact, operate as two separate systems, separate committees, separate structures within the league. And I will simply say parenthetically that um, we're not necessarily advocating that placement even be um, carried out through the function of a quote-unquote committee of people that advise people about placement opportunities. I think there are hundreds and hundreds of ways that leagues can begin to look at placement. Um, and for those of you that have had a chance to get some familiarity with the membership model part of the transformation rollout, this whole concept of the member compact where there really is a different kind of um, sort of choice negotiation between the member and the league really is a new placement concept and can take many different forms. So we're not advocating that there be a placement committee. What we are advocating is that there is a nominating committee. It is, elected, it is an elected committee, and it should not have placement responsibility. So let me, I've dumped a lot of information on you there and just make me let me make sure that there are no immediate questions or confusions about what I am talking about. Okay. So, here we go. The guiding principles of a healthy nominating process are that it is designed to match organizational and individual strengths. So again, this is where you are looking for that group of individuals who have the skills and qualifications and experience to carry out the responsibilities that are needed for the league to be effective. So it really is matching organizational and individual strengths. It is also premised, a healthy system is premised on the best qualified candidate based on who's available in the pool. Now you obviously, you can't slate someone who isn't even in the pool, so to some extent that is, that's an axiomatic assumption. But the, the point of emphasis on this concept is that what you are really looking for is the best qualified candidate, which is a far more, as you will see as I continue to lay out the new framework, is a far more strategic and situational decision than some junior league nominating processes historically have been. Um, you will hear me talk about the fact that we're no law, there's no such thing as it's someone's turn. Um, there's no such thing as, well, she's really experienced all other situations in the league, therefore it must be time for her to serve on the board. We are, we are suggesting that that is not the way that a, that a healthy and strong nominating process operates. Another very important guiding principle, and one that junior leagues have gotten much, much better at, but we still have a ways to go, is the idea that there are multiple paths to leadership. Back in the day, and I'm now talking probably 50, 60, 70 years ago, when in fact the junior league was the place where many of its members built all of their skills and had no other opportunities through employment or other community engagements to do skill development, what kind of evolved from that was the idea that everything you learned, you'd learned in the junior league. Therefore, the junior league was the place to look when you were looking for what leadership skills an individual had. Well, those days are gone, long gone. Um, and today you have members with skills and experiences that have been, that have been, have been acquired from a very wide variety of opportunities throughout their lives, including um, introduction to community volunteer service even back in high school. Um, and so it's been very important for leagues to shift their focus in nominating away from looking only at what the woman has done in the league and also placing an inordinately high value on what she learned in the league over what she might have learned somewhere else. Um, it's true that there is a that it, that it is important that a certain percentage of a board 
have strategic knowledge of the league and its operating conditions, which may require having had some league leadership experience. But what we had until recently was a system that not only overvalued junior league experience, very often used junior league experience to trump superior experience that someone had gotten outside of the league. And so it's extremely important that nominating really understand that you are looking for what someone knows how to do, which can have occurred in many different experiences in their lives, and that actually you want to value someone who has had a variety of leadership development opportunities and hasn't only existed in a single environment. So multiple paths to leadership is extremely, extremely important. And then a fourth principle is that whatever the process that is used by the league for its nominating function, that it be a process that is understood by all members. And remember going way back to the, to the beginning and my definition of governance and the fact that the board governs on behalf of all members, we said that all members is all members, inclusive of sustainers. And so it is extremely important that there be an explicit and accessible process that is that it that describes and defines how nominating functions that all members have an opportunity to understand because the nominating system in a junior league is um well i guess probably i let me let me back up here a little bit in the junior league the reason that the nominating committee is defined in the bylaws is because the nominating committee is considered to be what's called a committee of the corporation as opposed to a committee of the board in many nonprofits the nominating committee is a committee of the board and in that sense is um, chosen by the board very often and is accountable to the board in a junior league the decision has always been historically that it would be a committee of the corporation, which means that it is accountable to the membership for the nominating decisions, the slating decisions. It continues to be accountable to the board for making sure that the nominating process and that the nominating policies are consistent with the bylaws because that's the board's job. But fundamentally, the nominating committee really is accountable to the membership. And so it is extremely important that the membership understand the system by which they elect their leaders. And so that's really where this, this fourth guiding principle comes from. So key principles, matching organizational and individual strengths, ensuring that what you're after is the best qualified candidate who's available, that you want to encourage and make sure that your system values multiple paths to leadership, and that you have a process that is accessible and transparent to all members. It has three basic elements that differ from what you may be familiar with in your leagues. First, it is about competency and skills. Second, it is about being candidate initiated using an application. And third, it involves interviews directly with the candidate. So let me back up and describe a little bit about what I'm talking about. Um, competency and skills certainly is not meant to mean that up until this time, um, our nominating processes have not been focused on necessary skills or certainly that to suggest that the women who have been leading junior leagues for over 115 years have been incompetent. Um, no, the, the point is to focus more on what is a skill and competency set required for leadership on the board rather than focusing on some other factors that have tended to be a little bit more emphasized for many leagues. The second part of the paradigm, the fact that it is candidate initiated using an application, this is really where one of the bigger shifts takes place. Many junior leagues have historically used the placement system as the primary basis for decisions about what individual league members will be asked to do in future years. And it's part of the reason why in some leagues the nominating and placement committees have been put together. But instead of using a triangular system where a group of people talk about who should be considered, the new framework says, let's really put the candidate at the center of the process. Let us let her be the primary source of information about her candidacy, and let us also make her the person primarily responsible for determining whether or not she wishes to be considered. 
And then the third piece of the puzzle, which really does work off of the first, uh, the first and second elements, is the concept of introducing an interview process of the candidate and of her references as the way in which a nominating committee carries out its candidate assessment. So let's dig into these pieces a little bit more deeply. When we talk about competencies and skills, what we are interested in focusing on is identifying what are the abilities that a league needs at this particular point in time to meet its strategic needs. One of the things that we know we see in some leagues operating under the older nominating framework is that this concept of that a woman kind of works her way up to the point at which she, in the eyes of the nominating committee, is quote unquote ready to serve on the board. Instead, what we would ask the nominating committee to start to think about is where is the league strategically? Where are we trying to go as an organization over the next several years? And what are the strategic skills of the leaders that are going to take us there? The second piece of this puzzle that starts to be a little bit different is that the focus is less on the individual in a particular board position and more on building a leadership team. And again, this is part of that shift, moving governance out of management space into governing space. And as we know, a board, we've talked about this briefly in some of the earlier webinars, and we will definitely talk about it more as we go forward this year, the, the, the responsibility of governing is a collective or joint responsibility of the board. Um, a board of directors makes decisions by majority vote, typically of the members of the board, and no board member, including the president, has necessarily more power or authority than any other member. And no member of the board, including the president, has the authority to speak on behalf of the league unless she has been so authorized by the board. So now we're much more concerned with what is the team nature of the people that have been brought together, not so much from the perspective of, of, of how well they may get along, though we're certainly not necessarily interested in, in, in an antagonistic group, but more from the standpoint of what are the different skills and competencies that will make up a good team. I know that we're all aware of the fact that so much has been written lately about the fact that when you really think about it, important work rarely happens through the singular actions of an individual, um, that we're all better for collaborating, that we're all better for working in team environments to make decisions and move organizations forward. So nominating is now much more interested in what's the team. The, the concept of competencies and skills also focuses more now on what does the individual know how to do as differentiated from what she has done. Um, the example that I would give is we very often look at someone's resume and we look at um, all of the different things that she has done over a period of time and from that we've had a tendency to assume that the more positions someone has held, the more roles that they have played, the better qualified they are to move to the next level. And a competency skills-based nominating process actually seriously questions that. Um, it is not to suggest, again, that people are purposefully doing jobs badly, but it is to suggest that simply because someone has, let's say for the sake of argument, been a chair for a certain number of times, means that she is really, of all the people in the pool, the best qualified individual to put a team together, to help a team work through conflict, to um, encourage group decision making. So what you're much more interested in is what can the candidate tell you she knows how to do, indeed based on her past experience, and not focus on what has she done. Not The question isn't how many committees have you chaired, the question is what evidence can you give us that you really have strong team building abilities. Um, the candidate initiated application based process then puts the candidate at the center of these critical questions. You want the candidate to explain to the committee what it is she has in her experience that qualifies her to meet the competencies and skills that have been agreed to. Um, you are much more interested in the candidate giving you past evidence of what she has done, which again is why the shift is so strongly to um, moving away from a placement advisor saying, I think 
Barbara would be good for this position because I hear she does X well. Instead, having a conversation with Barbara saying, Barbara, talk to me about your experience doing X. So it really does begin to shift quite dramatically the framework for the nominating process. Candidate initiated also is meant to emphasize the fact that it is the woman who is choosing to seek leadership, not that the nominating committee has decided by whatever mechanism to reach out to her to encourage her to be considered. Um, this again, I know that many leagues have begun to move in this direction partially through what is very often called interest to serve um, or self-nomination processes. But those processes, as you'll see in a minute, don't go quite far enough in really putting the um, onus, if you will, the burden, if you will, on the member herself to say, I'm interested in serving on the board. Um, and in fact, one of the, one of the um, sort of cultural quirks, if you will, about our nominating process is that it actually has unintentionally um, developed over time in a way that oftentimes discourages women from saying, I would like to serve on the board. You're supposed to be um, a little bit more circumspect. You are supposed to wait for nominating to give some signal that they really think you should be in, in, in the pool of consideration. And we're suggesting that in today's day and age, um, it is much more important for the woman to self-identify and formally and, and, and very specifically put herself into the pool to be considered. It is also, I think, important for us to underscore that when you serve on the board, and I would add the management team in here for sure, this is not primarily a placement. It is not a placement from two very important perspectives. The first and foremost is that while we learn from all new experiences, there's, we would hope to never find ourselves doing anything um, over any reasonable period of time from which we were not going to learn new skills, learn new experiences, strengthen skills. But nevertheless, serving on a board and serving on the management team are not places where you learn how to govern and you learn how to manage fundamentally. You need to come to the table with a baseline of skills. Not everybody on the board and not everybody on the management team will have all of the skills and all of the competencies to the same degree, but everybody needs to be able to meet a baseline because the job of governing and the job of senior managing are jobs that must be done well to the maximum ability possible if the league is going to thrive. And so from that standpoint, this is not a conversation about it, I think you're ready to begin to look at governance, or I think you're ready to begin to look at management. Why don't you do a placement on the management team? That is not what this is about. This is about being elected to serve in a governing and a managing role. The other place where this differs also from our concept of placement is that the, the women who serve on the board and the women who serve on the management team, those two groups now become accountable for the uh, the operating agreements, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about in a couple of months, and for the, for, for the performance of the members of each of those groups. When a member on a committee um, runs into difficulty or has questions, she's very often directed to speak to her placement advisor because this is her placement. A board member should not do that. A management team member should not do that. Um, by the same token, when someone on the board is perhaps exhibiting some performance difficulty or on the management team. The tendency sometimes has been to bring in the placement advisor to deal with the problem or to bring in the nominating committee to deal with the problem. No, actually the group that needs to deal with the problem is the board if it's a board member and the management team if it's a management team member. Um, and so we really want to emphasize the fact that serving in elected leadership, governance or management, is really not part of the placement process as we have come to understand it. So let's now talk about this application. Um, and there is no um, particular way that it has to look on a piece of paper, but what I really want to work through with you is what are the steps that need to be included in your application. Um, the first is, is obvious, um, sort of name, rank, and serial number. Um, the person's name, um, how, they're, how they can be reached, uh, you know, email, telephone, address, and things like that. That's very basic. You would assume that that would be on an application. 
Then the next thing that is on the application, however, is um, this is really where the system begins to differ. And understand that this application would be part of a full um, board and or management team packet that would include all of the job descriptions, would include all of the competencies and skills that are relevant for the different positions, so that a woman who has chosen to apply would have reviewed a nominating packet that had a significant amount of information in it, most particularly about the individual positions. So what the application is then going to ask her to do because the application is going to list all of the positions for which nominating will be slating in, in a particular slating cycle. Um, for those leagues that are moving to longer terms, my pitch again, always and forever, um, not every position will be open every year because some of them will be, um, some people will be serving in the second year of a two-year term or possibly even in the second year of a three-year term. Who knows how far this can go? But nevertheless, the application, which therefore needs to be updated every year, would list each of the positions that is open for slating. And then you ask the candidate to do two things. The first thing you ask her to do is to go through that list and indicate the positions in which she is interested. You do not want her to rank the positions, however, in terms of her preference. And that goes back to what I said a little bit earlier about the fact that nominating is putting together a team. And so what you don't want is the candidate to get deeply wedded to, this is my first choice, this is my second choice, this is my third choice, because the nominating committee may well see that candidate in a couple of different spots and when it comes to putting together their ideal team, they really need the flexibility to go to someone and say, we, really, we would really like to, act to, to slate you in this position because we think you bring particular competencies and skills to the team. So you want her to go through and indicate with just a check the positions that she is interested in being considered for. Then, however, you ask her to go back through that same list and you ask her to put an X next to any position for which she is not interested, does not wish to be considered, and will not accept if offered. This is really where it shifts to the candidate being the decision maker as to whether or not she's in the pool and for what positions in the pool is she interested. And so if she says, I am not interested in being secretary, let's say for the sake of argument, Nominating no longer puts her on a list of people that they will schedule interviews for for the position of board secretary. She has said she does not wish to be considered for the position. She has said she will not accept it if offered. So again, we're also trying to remove a little bit of that, um, that challenge that nominating committees very often have is they reach out to individuals and say, you know, we'd like to slate you for secretary. And somebody says, well, no, 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 I really, I was never interested in secretary, but what I, I was interested in nominating chair, or I was interested in, in, an, in a member at large on the board um, or on the management team. We'd like to consider you uh, and slate you for the membership vice president. And the person says, well, no, I'm, I'm, my interests really are in communications and, and, and in community programs. So the candidate both indicates what she's interested in and also indicates what you should not consider her for. Then let's talk a little bit about references. Um, references are an important part of the process. Uh, we recommend that the application ask for three different types of references. The first would be a reference of someone who is outside of the league and preferably is not a league member. Um, this could be someone from the candidate's place of employment. This could be someone from the candidate's faith community. Um, this could be a professional colleague. This could be anyone that the candidate chooses who is not in the junior league and where the relationship is not primarily um, member to member. The second reference is a league member. Um, and the only restriction in that department would be, and each nominating committee can decide how far down the relationship path they want to go, but that obviously candidates uh, may not use family members as references, and the nominating committee can decide how far out the family tree you're going to go before you, you rule it out. Um, you know, 47th cousin 15 times removed might not be a problem. 
but um, sisters, mothers, aunts um, probably are a problem. Um, there's there's the there's really no ability to to have any, nor should there be, to have any um, sort of objective objective distance from the candidate. So you want the second reference to be a league member, and then the third reference needs to be someone in the league who has in. Um, doing this in quotes, who has supervised the candidate. So a committee chair, um, a vice president of a council, and this person has served as a committee chair on that council. And what you're looking for here, and this is where we hope to assure the nominating process and the nominating committee that we are wanting to balance um, the candidate's ability to represent herself with being able to get some independent validation of her ability. And so we ask that she name someone who has supervised her. Now, is the candidate likely to name a supervisor where it was a good experience? Of course they are. But what we want to assure you on all of these references is that we're not talking about reference letters. Don't, don't go down that path. That is, that is too complicated. It doesn't serve any valid purpose. The references will also be asked to comment on the candidate in the context of those competencies and skills. So let's say for the sake of argument that you were talking to the uh, league supervisory reference for Barbara, and um, what you are particularly interested in, because your interview with Barbara suggested she had some skill, but you have some concerns there, you would perhaps ask that league supervisory reference to say, would you please comment on Barbara's skills as a team builder? And the reference might say, oh, she's a great team builder. Would you comment a little bit more deeply? Could you describe how you have experienced her team building skills? So now the person really does have to dig into um, much more of, of an analytical um, assessment of the candidate and isn't there to just say, oh, she's wonderful, she's great, I liked working with her, she was friendly. None of that is relevant to this particular process. What is relevant is what is the references experience with the candidate relative to the competencies and skills. Interview-based, now all of this rolls up to the interview. We're talking about a different kind of interviewing, and if any of you um, have experience in human resources, and certainly in your leagues, there are definitely going to be women who do, they will recognize this because it is a practice that is used as part of many employment situations. Behavioral interviewing is interested, again, goes back to that, what do you know how to do, not what have you done? What is the evidence that you can give us, what is the evidence you can give us reference that this candidate does, in fact, um, have experience in strategic visioning, that this candidate does have experience working with diverse and inclusive environments, that this candidate does have experience team building, that this candidate does have experience using conflict to arrive at strong solutions. And so the behavioral interviewing is really quite simple because the question, at least the lead-in question, is virtually the same over and over again. You basically start by saying to the candidate, please tell us about a time when you had to put a team together. or please tell us about a time when you had to dismantle a team because it was no longer functional. And some of you might be saying, well, okay, I see how that sort of gets around the tell me what you would do with this position, which is kind of future hope. Um, but anybody can interview well for a position. And I say, yes, you're absolutely right. Some people will interview better than others. And so one of the ways that you um, minimize or mitigate um, kind of uh, the performance bias, if you will, of some candidates, is you can ask the same question a second or even a third time if it's really critical to you. So let's say that Barbara has answered, you know, the team building question the first time using a league example, and you might ask a follow-up question like, you know, what, what did you find most difficult about that team building experience? But then you might say, so Barbara, please give us another team building experience that you've had. This time, please use your work experience. Um, so now the candidate, she's got to shift out of the junior league space and she's got to shift into thinking about her paid work experience. Now hopefully, any candidate worth her salt has spent time thinking about the competencies and thinking about what it is she believes she has experiences in. So shifting from a junior league experience to a paid work experience should not throw her. 
But if it does throw her, that's actually going to tell you something, that she actually has fairly thin experience in that area. Um, and that is exactly what you're trying to find out. However, behavioral interviewing isn't the only kind of interviewing that is used, and it is certainly appropriate to ask some additional questions. Um, this is particularly important, I think, when you are thinking about interviewing the PE and the EVP position, where what you want to also ask them in addition to behavioral questions is what things like, and one of the questions that I think is really important to ask both of those positions is what are they how do they currently assess the strategic position of the league in its external community? And um, what you want the candidate to do is not just tell you what she thinks, but you also then want to follow that up with, and why do you see it that way? So if someone comes along and says, I think the junior league is, is one of the most highly recognized um, and reputable women's volunteer organizations in our community, um, what do you base that on? And so the person can't just be, again, wishful thinking, future hoping. She really is going to have to tell you, well, I, we are sitting at these tables. We have been involved in these task forces. We are playing these roles. Our members are doing these things. So she has to give you some insight into how she arrived at that conclusion. I think it's also extremely important for particularly, again, PE and EVP, but I would frankly ask it of any anybody on either the board or the management team to give you a clear understanding of what the league's current strategic goals are. Um, sad as it may be, uh, there are all too many occasions when I've certainly been in conversation with league leaders and we've been trying to understand where the league is trying to go and the person says, you know, give me a minute. I know my strategic plan is here someplace. She shouldn't have to look for the plan to be able to tell you what the top three strategic priorities are. If she has to look for the plan, she doesn't really understand the league's strategic position. So there are additional questions that you ask in an interview, but the core, the, the, the sort of the centerpiece of the interview experience is behavioral interviewing designed to understand what the candidate knows how to do. So those are the essential elements. I think you can see what a dramatic shift this is from um, a very placement-focused nominating process that most leagues are using, one that is reactive. We're going to talk in a little minute about how do you actually now move um, the league into this new process. Um, how do you get them ready? What is a pipeline building strategy that will ensure that when you open that application box it isn't empty? Um, and how do you also help the membership begin to shift their understanding of the nominating, and, uh, nominating process so that they are prepared to put themselves into the mix so that they really do understand what the competencies and skills are. But let me pause here and see if there are any questions. We can pop them into the chat box. Um, and uh, we'll take a few questions here and then we'll, then we'll go into the pipeline building. Right now, we have some significant challenges in many, many leagues in terms of how the relationship between the board and the nominating committee plays out. They view each other with suspicion. Um, they view each other with a significant amount of antagonism. Um, they question whether or not they really should actually have a relationship at all. And I'm hoping that I can really reframe that very quickly for you because they must have a highly collaborative relationship. They jointly are responsible for assuring that there is a high qualified leadership that is able to take the league forward. And one of the only ways that that can happen is if they actually come together. Now some of you may say, well, yeah, that's okay. We don't need to do that because the nominating chair is on the board. Yes, she's on the board. She should be on the board. But that's not the same as having the entire nominating committee sit down with the entire board, not just the president and the PE, and have a really focused strategic discussion on where is the league trying to go, what are the leadership skills that are going to get us there, how are we going to make sure that we have a robust pipeline, what are we going to do to strategically position this league through its leadership. And that ideally should be two meetings a year, one before the 
whole sort of slating process gets underway, and one at the end to look back and talk about what do we need to focus on going forward? Did we have a strong pipeline? Did we have a deep pool? And then, as we've said, that one of the ways that we maintain that connection is through the recommendation that the nominating chairman is a full voting member of the board. So let's take a look at some of the key responsibilities in this process. The nominating committee and the board jointly should agree to what the skills and competencies are for the different jobs on the three groups. So that does mean that the nominating committee will have primary responsibility for developing the job descriptions and the competency skills list, but the board agrees to it. And those become fairly fixed until circumstances justify their being changed. They also share a responsibility for having a strategy for building the pipeline, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. And they should jointly decide what the appropriate timeline for different key decisions in the nominating process should be, when applications should be due, when the slate should come out, um, when the election should be held. Some of this will be established in bylaws, particularly around notice of the slate and the election process. And we'll talk about that when we, when we touch the bylaws. But when timeline issues are not fixed in the bylaws, this should be a joint agreement. It is not up to the nominating committee to call the board up one day and say, yeah, we know the slate usually comes out the 1st of December, but we don't think we can make that this year. So we, think we don't think we're going to be ready until January. That's not acceptable. Um, that is an organizational decision that has a significant impact on a whole lot of other factors, and so the board and the nominating committee really do need to make this one jointly. Then the board has responsibility for deciding what the structure is. So it isn't up to nominating to say, we don't think we should have X position on the management team anymore because we've had a hard time filling that position. No, it's up to the board and only the board to decide what the structure and composition of the board is, the management team or councils, and then the nominating committee. The board is also ultimately responsible for the written policies that define the nominating process. Now, I think all of this should be very collaborative with nominating's input, but if you're talking about who has the ultimate decision authority, it's the board, because the board is accountable for the governance of the organization. And then the board is the independent verifier of eligibility. And there are lots of different ways to do that. We typically recommend that at the very beginning of the process, the nominating committee present the board with a list of every member of the league and indicate what it is she is presently eligible for. Whether she ever applies for it or not, it doesn't matter, because all the board is focused on is you have a list of people for PE, and our rules say that somebody to be PE has to have served on the board within the last five years. The board needs to look at that list, and if it says, now wait a minute, you've got Margaret on that list, and Margaret has never served on the board, then Margaret's name has to go off the list and she can't be considered. So it's a trust and verify kind of framework here, but that is the board's accountability. Then it's up to nominating to decide what are the procedures to implement those policies. But they have to stay within the policy parameter. That's, that's kind of the authority funnel. They are responsible for the training and preparation of the nominating committee. And then nominating and solely nominating are ultimately have the authority to make the confidential slating decisions. But this is the only part of the process that is confidential. Unfortunately, we've evolved a system where all of this stuff is a little secret and murky. This is what's confidential. Everything else here should be absolutely explicit, transparent, in writing, on the website, and available to anybody who's interested in it. But this is how these roles really should play out, and this is quite a departure from what happens in many leagues, starting with the fact that, for the most part, the board and the nominating committee never get together. And that really is, that's not healthy. It's a trust relationship in which nominating really does have to demonstrate full support for the policies and the process that has been agreed to. There has to be deep respect for what is confidential. And there also must be respect going back from the nominating committee to the board for the board's overall governing authority. 
we don't have time today to talk about um, this the, the concept of an additional candidate process, but we will talk about it on the roundtable. Most of your bylaws allow for the membership to bring forward another candidate if there's somebody that they think should have been on the slate that's not. Um, and it's one of the it's a democratic principle. It rarely is used in order if, if it's being used a lot, then it means you have a problem in your system. But it's a it's a process that the board and the nominating committee absolutely must uphold. And it's a tough one for them because the nominating committee feels disrespected because the membership wants to bring forward Sally May and they didn't slate Sally May. They may have even interviewed her and they didn't slate her. But the membership wants to bring her forward and that's their right. But the board has to stand with nominating and help them sort of uphold that, that, basic, um, that basic principle. Um, yeah, Lynn, we, can, we will certainly talk about some sample policies and procedures um, that will help you all going forward. So I know that trust is thrown around a lot, but this really is a very powerful relationship that has to be built on mutual trust. Building the pool. Obviously, all of this rests on having a robust pool. Um, and one of the things that we need to do is to back it up and not start to focus on the pool in the year in which we want to draw from the pool. Um, there is actually a wonderful book about networking, the title of which is Build Your Well Before You're Thirsty. Um, it is generally preferred, not, there's no rule here, but Typically, nominating committees don't like to prospect, and by prospect, I mean specifically targeting an individual, calling her up, taking her out for a cup of coffee, and urging her to apply. Nominating typically doesn't like to do that because often they are misunderstood. The person doesn't really believe that nominating isn't basically giving them the hint that we're going to slate you, when in fact they may not be at all. They're, they want you in the pool. Um, so the board is in a better position to do that, but the board has to do it in an extremely balanced and even-handed way. Um, otherwise, the board will be appearing to tilt toward a particular type of member that they are encouraging to slate or that they're only taking their friends out for coffee. Um, so all of this is very strategic and very balanced, but the board tends to be better at prospecting with the nominating committee being responsible for the broader marketing messages that go out to everyone. It also, you want people to succeed in this system. So one of the things that I recommend that nominating committees do is to hold a couple of opt-in. Don't do these as required GMM training. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but do a couple of opt-in sessions on how to fill out a good application and prepare a good resume. What does a good one look like? How to interview well. Teach people how to do behavioral interviewing. You can't, you're not going to game the system. They're going to have the knowledge then to take a look at those competencies, reflect on their abilities, and come in prepared to give you their best foot forward, which is exactly what you want. Then I also think it's a really valuable thing for the board and the management team to hold their own sessions, opt in, on what it's like to serve on these two groups. Very often there's a lot of mythology about, um, about you know, what it actually means to serve on the board or what it actually means to serve on the management team. You know, I understand people call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. Is that true? Um, I understand that you haven't seen your family in six months. Is that true? Um, and so sort of humanize what these groups are like, and then I think it also helps people really decide that they do see themselves in leadership. Let's see, Kristen, will this call? Yes, all of the webinars are recorded. So um, I actually hope that for those of you that don't have members of your nominating committee on this one, that you will give them the webinar tape. And it'll be available within 24 hours. So yes, absolutely. But this is why nominating is a full-time year-round job, because to do this work well, is to do it all the time so that you are continually encouraging people, you are continually making sure that you have an accessible process. And I know I'm speeding up a bit, but I think we've come to the end. Um, and I certainly am willing to stick around for another couple of minutes. I know that I've thrown a tremendous amount at you. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to touch on the self-directed activities in just a minute. 
but um, it is available to be listened to again, and obviously the handout is available, and we will dig into some of the elements of the new system when we have the roundtable. So let's take a look at, oh, I'm sorry, I completely forgot. These are some of our barriers. I've already talked about magical thinking. There is an entitlement mindset. It's her turn. It's my turn. I should have gotten that. I've been in the league 16 years. I've never been on the board. Why didn't you slate me? Um, that we lose, tr we we count, we we dis, we unbalance, I should say, and put too much emphasis on training. She's never had an opportunity to do this. Why don't we let her train at it? Not a good idea unless the person comes with the baseline ability to do the job. You can always slate somebody who has less experience to be able to deepen her experience, but she needs to come to the table with the baseline ability to do the job of the board, the management team, or the nominating committee. Um, some of those opt-in sessions are designed to get at this idea that this is terribly stressful. Our turnover creates huge problems. We've talked about that, and I will continue to talk about that throughout the rest of this year. That we confuse secrecy and confidentiality. The nominating process is not secret. The nominating deliberations about individuals are confidential. There is a mile of difference between those two. Somebody's turn is very much related to this entitlement framework and the idea that when you are being strategic, you're being unfair. Um, and these, these are not, there's no magic way to get over these. These are just some of our cultural barriers and I want to lift them up so that you're aware of them. And then, two things to do before the round table, hopefully. Meet with your president, president-elect, and nominating chair, and simply educate them on the new paradigm. This isn't the time to advocate starting an application tomorrow or starting interviewing yesterday. This is simply, here's a new framework. Let's take a look at it. Let's, let's better understand it. Post any questions that come up, and there will be lots of them in the group share, and then um, take a crack at identifying what you think competencies and skills are that would incline someone toward a board leadership position and a management team position. There will be some similarities, but there will be some differences. And again, just pop those lists into that group share by August 30th, and then we'll be able to use them in the roundtable discussion. And if it turns out, that you have more questions and more thoughts about this process during the roundtable, we can schedule a second one. Um, this sometimes is a topic that, that could use with a couple of informal gatherings, so we, we can certainly do that. And we are truly down to final questions. I know that there's probably a lot bubbling in your heads. You know how to find me an email, and I'm happy to take any questions offline that you want me to dig into in greater detail. Um, I will post the sample job descriptions into your group share. Um, I think we also may have a, the, the application you can design any way you want, but I think we may have an example of what one actually looks like, so I will pop them into your group share. I will also put some information in about competencies and skills, and you'll see in these job descriptions how competencies come into play. And yeah, Misty, we do have a sample. But to some extent, if you literally just follow the outline of what I said, you'll create your own. But I will, I will certainly show you. And so, again, I apologize for um, going over just a bit. This may actually need to become a little bit longer webinar going forward. Um, but I look forward to your questions, and I look forward to the, um, the roundtable on the 30th, and continue to enjoy summer, and be well. Thanks, everyone.